Welcome to the Buy Box Experts Podcast. We bring to light the unique opportunities brands face in today's e-commerce world. Hi, this is James Thompson from the Buy Box Experts Podcast. Today's episode is part of a special series of interviews that we have done to dive deeper into the recent phenomenon of private equity companies and FBA aggregators investing in private label brands that are leveraging the Amazon sales channel. As part of this series, we interview a wide range of investors, brokers, consultants, and entrepreneurs that have recently sold their private label brands. We peel back the layers on what's happening in this new investment space and look at how private label brands are finding financial success through the building and eventual sale of their online businesses. For three weeks from mid-February through early March, we will release a new episode every weekday on this topic. Sit back and enjoy today's episode. Hi, I'm James Thompson, one of the hosts of the BuyBox Experts podcast. I'm a partner at BuyBox Experts and the former business head of the Selling on Amazon team at Amazon, as well as the first account manager for the Fulfillment by Amazon program. I'm the co-author of a couple of books on Amazon, including the recent book, Controlling Your Brand in the Age of Amazon. Today's episode is brought to you by BuyBox Experts. BuyBox Experts takes ambitious brands and makes them unbeatable. When you hire BuyBox experts, you receive the strategy optimization and marketing performance to succeed on Amazon. We also support investors on due diligence services. Go to buyboxexperts.com to learn more. Before I introduce our guest today, I'd like to send a big shout out to the team at Disruptive Advertising. For off Amazon advertising, Disruptive Advertising offers the highest level of service in the digital marketing industry. Focusing on driving traffic, converting traffic, and enterprise analytics, Disruptive helps its clients increase their bottom line month after month. Check out disruptiveadvertising.com to learn more. Today, I am pleased to welcome our guest, Chris Bell, CEO of Perch, a company that acquires and operates Amazon FBA businesses. Previously, Chris spent three and a half years at Wayfair, leading multiple supply chain teams. Chris has also been a management consultant for Bain and Company. Chris, Welcome and thank you for joining us today on the Buy Box Experts podcast. Thanks, James. Nice to be here. I want to start by asking the obvious. Uh, FBA private label businesses are a hot commodity today, but they've been around for 20 plus years. What's going on in the last year to two years that all of a sudden investors are paying attention to these types of organizations? Yeah, I think a few things are going on. Um, The first is that you I'd say about five years ago, Amazon was not quite as mature or trusted as a marketplace where you could buy a private label business and have confidence that you were buying Mm -hmm. something to stay in power. Mm -hmm. You know, five years ago, it was a lot easier to buy fake reviews than it is today. Five years ago, Amazon didn't have brand registry 2.0. And so they weren't enforcing brand rights the way they are today. Yep. Um, And so uh, the, the good news is Amazon's fixed many of these problems. Um, so we can now buy a brand that has 12,000 five-star reviews and feel confident that tomorrow somebody else will have 12,000 five-star reviews that they just purchased right. Uh, from right. somebody else. And we can have confidence that uh, the brand that we purchased, Amazon, will help us protect our brand rights, protect the IP. And so um, those reasons have, have made it more of a stable marketplace where you can make a transaction. And then I think Part of why there's been so much excitement around the space over the last uh, year, especially, um, it's been interesting to see. So we, uh, I started this journey about a year and a half ago, um, just poking around and then raised money about a year ago to start. <laughs> and back then, you know, Thrasio was around um, and it was us, but that was about it. And most investors I talked to had never heard of this space. Right. <laughs> um, you know, us announcing our fundraising, some of the bigger announcements um, by Thrasio, caused, and that coupled with COVID. And a whole bunch of people wondering where to put their money and seeing how Amazon was taking off made, uh, made I think, a lot of investors look at this space and a lot of other entrepreneurs look at this space as well. What do you think is going to happen in the next two years as a number of these aggregators start investing in these firms? Uh, you know, historically, companies like Thrasio basically had their pick of whatever a broker put out on the website. Obviously, there's a lot more people poking around. Where, where, where do we go in the next two years, both as buyers and as sellers? Yeah, I think uh, a few things are going to happen. Um, one, yeah, there's a lot of money coming into this space, as you've heard. I think that uh, many of these entrepreneurs will find out what, what I've found out over the last 14 months. Uh, this is really hard. 
right? These are hard businesses to run. There's a lot of complexity. I remember the first conference I went to in New York and I was, I was talking to some of the sellers over lunch and one of them described this as the most complex, simplest business you'll ever run. <laughs> and they seem simple because you have maybe only five products, uh, five ASINs to manage, um, but massively complex because you're dealing with Chinese suppliers, freight forwarders, customs, brokers, dealing with Amazon, who's its own, uh, its own animal in many ways. Um, you might have black hat tactics against you. There's, there's a whole bunch of things that can happen. Um, and so I, I expect that um, once COVID dies down and once a few of these uh, aggregators, I, I expect several of them will be successful, but I also think several of them will buy a few brands and then probably stop, right? They, yeah. They'll yeah. either get overwhelmed by the complexity or they decide they don't want to do it anymore and maybe they'll sell to someone like us. Um, so I think there will be a little bit. Today, it's very frothy and very exciting. I think there'll be on the buyer side a little bit of a settling in the uh, in the coming uh, months and years, and, and a few leaders will emerge from that. Um, and then on the seller side, on the people creating these brands, I really hope, and one of the things is we thought about our mission and vision as we created Perch, was that we want to um, be a, not only a, a liquidity event for these sellers, but a resource for them. We want them to be successful. One of the things I love about this business, and part of why I got into this, thinking back to that first conference I went to, I was still at Wayfair actually when I went to that conference. So I was just thinking about getting into this. And these sellers are just such true entrepreneurs. They're bootstrapped. They have really created a business out of nothing. Um, and so I'm excited to, to be able to kind of help build that community and give them an exit. And I hope many of them go back and do it again and again. And so I think that we will get continuing high quality entrepreneurs coming to this space, staying in this space, making really, really good products hopefully selling them to somebody like Perch and then doing it again. And then people like Perch, we can create real scale machines where we can take what somebody's built, you know, the way I talk about it with my team, is these entrepreneurs take it from zero to two, right? They launch a great product. They get it maybe on .com in the US. Sometimes they go to Europe, but usually they don't. But then they oftentimes don't have the working capital or the, you know, honestly, just the, the size to build a team kind of a world-class team to go right, out right. to opportunities and supply chain opportunities and things like that. And so then we can take it and we can take it from two to 10 and we can make these brands consumer brands. We can you know make it so that they're brands that people know in their houses and talk about with their friends. Um, and so it's, I, I'm really excited to continue to accelerate this trend that has been going on. And I think over time, many of these micro brands will be replacing major CPG brands in the minds of end consumers. And it will be a real powerhouse within uh, within the U.S. and globally. Well, certainly a lot of these big national brands are having their lunches eaten on Amazon because they're not playing the game very well. So uh, you know, certainly opportunity for even the little guy to take on the big guy and win. It's kind of, kind of exciting. Let me ask you this. You, you didn't grow up as an FBA private label seller. You talked about some aspects of this, but to talk to me a little bit more about what drew you to this space and what kinds of issues have surprised you the most as you've learned more and more about the subculture of entrepreneur. Yeah, absolutely. So as I started to learn about this space, it seemed like the perfect thing for me to go and do, um, mostly based on three prior experiences in my career. The first is that the first thing I ever did um, in undergrad and out of undergrad was I developed software. Okay. Um, I was a GE, I was a product manager, and I was implementing scale software sy systems to help General Electric uh, run its business. The second is when I was at Bain, I did a lot of m and I advised on over 40 m and transactions. And so I, I saw a lot of how big private equity companies value transactions, what goes into it, what you have to watch out for. Um, and then the third was at both Bain and then at Wayfair, a lot of e-commerce experience. Retail, tech, and e-commerce was basically what I did for you know, the last eight years of my career before I started Perch. Um, and so thinking about what, uh, what the opportunity is here of buying companies, scaling them, and then using technology to drive that scale, it just seemed like the absolute most perfect thing I could do is the next step to my career, building on all of my experiences. Um, and then what surprised me, I guess, you, you know, <laughs> all the paper cuts, I guess, right? It's easy to see the big problems and it's easy to anticipate the big problems, but thinking about, um, you know, we had an ASIN shut down for 50 days because of an administrative error. And every time we called Amazon, we just got sent in a circle five different teams would say, oh, I can see what it is. It's just a simple typo. Our transparency code got put in the SKU code number and they basically switched the SKU and the transparency numbers. 
and then flagged us as a counterfeit seller. And for 50 days, every team was like, yeah, should be a problem, but this next guy will fix it for you. Um, and Welcome so to Amazon. Like <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so things like that, right? And every day, every month, there's more and more little things that we would like to be able to capture and put a process around and put a system around um, and eliminate in kind of more traditional world. And you just have this big counterparty that you just can't control, right? And you have to, you have to manage them as a counterparty versus if it was all within our own control, we could eliminate those defects pretty quickly. There are literally thousands of private label brands out there on Amazon. When you start looking at a brand, what are the, the sorts of things that you look for initially that gets you more than just excited? You say, oh yeah, we need to, we need to spend the hours starting to dive into this one. Yeah, for sure. We, what we call them internally is winning products. So we look for winning products. We like products that have, you know, in general, um, everybody likes to guess what's going to win. We can all look at a product and say, I think that looks beautiful. I think that's going to sell well. Uh, we're very data driven. So we like to see products that have a consistent history of market share, stability or growth, great reviews by both count and rating, um, low return rates, good unit economics. And so we generally like Win, you know, products that are winning within their niche um, and have a, a history of winning. Um, and so you know, the, the best products that we love the most have more than just a little bit of a review mode, they right? have a meaningful gap between them and their number two. We love it even more when they've shown an ability to price consistently higher than those. So they're not getting caught in, the, in price, uh, price wars, but rather they're using their review mode and a, and a high quality product. They actually be able to price at a premium. Um, we look at obviously um, product level economics, right? So some businesses have a bunch of products that have peaked and are declining, and they're they're making up for that by just launching new products as, as quickly as they can. And we generally we we view it as a collection of products, right? We evaluate each product um, on their own, and if most of your portfolio, especially your winners, are declining, that's much less interesting to us. With, with all the new interests and all these new investors looking at companies, do you think there's enough companies out there where aggregators can wait for these companies to come available for sale? Or do you think that aggregators need to be more aggressive in going out and finding brands that didn't realize they were about to sell? Um, I think both. So as we've called down the universe of company of uh, private label brands, we think that there's um, over 25,000 brands that are on our short list, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty long short list. And as you know, there's actually millions of sellers. This is just the kind of really tight view of the people we think that we would like to own. And not all of them. Sometimes we get in touch with some of them and some of them aren't quite a fit, but it's been a pretty good heuristic to get to most of those people. When we get into their seller account, We it's confirmed that we would like to own this company if we can come to terms. Um, and so I think that with a market that big, it's great. Actually, is, as much as it's uh, tough because it's getting more competitive uh, for a buyer like us, it's been great because you know last February I went to a conference in Brooklyn and mm -hmm. I sat I, over lunch I just sat at three random tables and I talked to introduce myself told them what I did at every single table nobody knew that they could sell their business it was a totally novel mm -hmm. concept to them at a pretty good conference um, in New York and so um, and so the awareness right I think about our our buying process buying sellers as a B two B sales funnel and the top of any sales funnel is awareness. And so the, all the news, all this is actually great because it's driving a lot of awareness. We're getting incredible amounts of inbound interest through our website of people saying, hey, I read about you in the news. I heard about this thing. Some other seller reached, or buyer reached out to me. I want to hear what you guys have to offer. And so I think you know, obviously going quickly for us is important because we want to continue. You know, the more we build scale, the more we can do the things we want to do with these businesses. But also there's going to be room for several big players in this space. Big players is in people like us, you know, with this many businesses um, that we all would like, you know, 200 billion in 2019 of GMB from the third party marketplace. And so I think also we're trying to be thoughtful and take our time and buy only good businesses, not get caught up in some of the price craziness that's going on um, for some of these assets. And so we're still finding a lot of great entrepreneurs with great companies that want to do what feels like a reasonable deal and want to work with us because they know us and trust us and uh, we've committed to a fair and transparent process with them. A lot of the sales that have sold recently are companies that are, uh, you know, one to 2 million top line. They might sell for a three, four multiple. Uh, you know, these, these are sales of under $10 million typically, but there are mega private label sellers out there 
who at some point they're going to sell and they're going to require 80, $100 million to exit. When you look at the aggregators out there right now, 80 to $100 million, that pretty much um, wipes out most of the portfolio assets available for, for many of these companies. Yep. That begs the question, where are the, where's the next round of you know, billion-dollar portfolio companies that go in and start buying up the bigger brands? But what's going to happen there? And, and do you see yourself eventually getting into a space where you're able to compete for much, much larger brands? Um, yeah, the short answer is yes. I think that the most likely outcome is that uh, Perch or, or a couple companies like Perch end up getting to that space. Um, I could tell you with reasonably high confidence that if an $80 million top line brand came to us today and said, we want to sell, I could go to my investors and we could figure something out, right? So there's, there's good appetite in this space to do deals. And uh, the, the capital that we raised today has been based on the opportunity we see today. And as that opportunity grows, I think capital will become available. Um, that's the most likely outcome. Is there a world where somebody comes in and just tries to do, do the mega deals? Maybe. Um, but then you'd be taking kind of all that risk with, unless they bought one of them as a platform and started doing more around there or something like that, <laughs> to invest in a company, uh, kind of an unknown set of Amazon FBA operators and to give them a billion dollars and say, hey, go buy ten hundred million dollar companies. Um, not hey, so swamp not land in Florida for you too while you're at it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so yeah. I think but once we kind of, you know, as we, you know, as we've done, like we'll have um, more than 20 deals done by the end of this year. We'll have more than 50 to 70 deals done by the end of next year. Right. And as we get that proven track record, it'll be easier and easier for us to raise that kind of money and go do those types of deals. The question I would have on the other side is, you know, depending on the capital structure of those companies, do they want to sell? If I owned hundred percent, of a company that was generating $80 million of revenue a year and something on the order of 20 to 30% margins. I mean, maybe I'd want to sell. I guess it depends what the number is, but uh, I think those guys are also doing quite well for themselves. Mm -hmm. let, let, let's talk for a minute about if, if you could give a masterclass to private label brands as they start to think about the possibility of selling. You know, you go back to your discussion last February with companies that didn't even realize they could sell. There are some basics that every brand needs to look at before they prepare themselves for sale. What are some of the nuanced issues that you're now realizing a lot of these companies don't have the basics down pat, and you'd like to see them get themselves organized before wasting anyone's time to start you know, possibly looking for a sale? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of pieces in there. One is that we actually, we don't mind um, if you don't have all your ducks in a row. We rebuild the PL anyway. And so in general, um, you know, if, if folks are worried about getting their ducks in a row before calling us, they don't have to. We, we would be happy to work with you. We, you obviously need to be able to track down documents around all your expenses and things like that. But as long as you can find the invoices and send them our way and share credit card statements and bank statements and stuff like that, we'd be happy to rebuild the p and um, But as you think about maximizing the value that you might get on exit, which is, I assume, what most of these folks in this theoretical masterclass would be asking about, we find it's actually been funny because uh, a lot of investors ask the same question, right? Where do you find the most value post acquisition? And it's it varies a lot. We find some sellers who are great at marketing and have tacos that's two percent, and they're still bestseller badge on all these high volume keywords, but they're paying out the nose on supply chain and they're air freighting things in every two weeks, and and we're just there's just money sitting on the table on the supply chain side. And then we see the other side, right? Where people have this amazing, super lean supply chain and great cost of goods sold. And, you know, their talk list is 17% and it's a whole bunch of wasted spend and they're cannibalizing a bunch of their organic sales. And so I don't know if there's a single um, silver bullet, but it's, uh, I guess you, you could outline, you know, think about optimizing your top line. Where are you ranking? I see maybe a lot of people overly focused on top line growth kind of sometimes at the expense of a margin and uh, and thinking about how you balance those things in a thoughtful way so that there's times mm -hmm. to invest and it's okay to lose money when you're trying to launch a product, you're trying to gain ranking. Yeah. At the end of the day, business is about making money. So if you never pull back and you never actually kind of capture some margin from that position that you built, you know, you're just letting, you're paying Amazon, right? All those ad dollars go straight in Amazon, Amazon's pocket. Um, and so it's, there's, no, there's no silver bullet, but in general, building a good business with good products and great customer reviews and great customer advocacy 
is what we look for. Um, and the rest of it is, uh, you know, we can help through that. Where do you typically look at prospects, businesses and say, there's future growth opportunity, there's future growth opportunity. You talked about some of these cost issues where you can wrangle out inefficiencies in supply chain or in advertising, but, but are there inherent market conditions that you're also looking for that help you to say, we see that if we invest more heavily in this brand, we can definitely grow this substantially. Get a, th- yeah. a five bag or a 10 bagger right there. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think those revolve around um, typically the way we look at it is leveraging the existing assets. And so if you have a really strong review position, but you're only ranking on a few keywords, we look at kind of where are your competitors ranking, right? And can can we also rank on those other keywords? Same thing globally. We find um, a lot of sellers, usually for capital constraint reasons, right? They don't have the working capital to put inventory in the US and in Europe. Um, and you know, this was an amazing change Amazon made about a year ago. I forget when. Before then, your reviews went port internationally. Now, when you uh, when you sell a product in uh, in other uh, other markets, you keep all your reviews. And the U.S. is the largest and most mature market, which means we have the most reviews. So we oftentimes, when we launch see we, when we launch products in uh, in Europe and the U.K., that we'll have many more reviews than our competition. So again, taking that same asset, the the ASIN, the product with great reviews. And pushing it to more keywords and more geographies um, on the top line is usually one of the most surefire ways to drive growth. And then, like I said, on the bottom line, um, yeah, it's not rocket science. It's just doing some good inventory planning, staying away from air freight when you can, trying to um, ship in bulk whenever you can, right? Instead of doing onesie, two things all over the place, um, they pay for somebody to move a lot of things at once. Have you had any luck with 1P brands? Uh, we have not been going after one free brands um, to date, and so it's not an area we've been, we've invested much. Talk to me a little bit about how your firm is differentiated from other FBA aggregators today. What, what would you like uh, people listening today to say when Perch says this, this, and this? It's not the same thing I've heard from every other aggregator. Yeah, I can tell you. I can tell you what you, we say. The sad, uh, the unfortunate part is it feels like. People have copied our website, and so they might all say uh, the same thing. But but we mean it. Um, and uh, but generally, um, selling your business is the biggest financial decision you will ever make. Right? It's bigger than selling your house. It's uh, this is your livelihood, and so you want to work with people you trust. You want to work with people that you think um, will be fast, fair, transparent, and will take your brand to the next level and will continue to grow your brand. Um, and so. You know, the, the main thing that I can say to that is we have a whole big list of referrals and we'd be happy to connect you to sellers who have worked with us. We obviously pay our, all of our commitments, but also we're very transparent and we walk through our process with you. We share back the P&L that we've created. We work with you to understand um, how your business is going um, and we move quickly and we know what we're doing and we, we haven't had any failed transactions. Um, and then post acquisition, right? our portfolio is growing really, really strongly. Post acquisition, we've paid, um, I think we've paid almost all of our earnouts that have come due today. I can't think of a single one we haven't paid. Right, so um, uh, the brands are doing well, the products are doing well, um, and we know what we're doing. And obviously, we have big financial backing, and so um, you don't have to worry about uh, about that. Piece. So you've um, chosen to keep a lot of the management teams of these companies around, keep the founders on the team. So talk to me about how that works. You know, for some companies, they want to sell so they can go golfing. For other other teams, you know, if they're expected to stick around for a period of time, how do they do that while somebody else is managing the baby? Yeah, so um, so we don't typically keep the founders around for longer than a transition period. So usually we have, you know, it's called a three to four month transition period where the founders work with us to make sure we don't lose Right, there's a lot of nuance that goes into these categories and products. We want to make sure we don't lose any of that. Usually, it's not a full-time job during that period. It's, it's usually a pretty um, steeply declining curve of, of effort. Um, and then, because of the earnouts, we um, we stay in touch with the founders. We obviously share information with them about how their business is doing. They can also see that, right? Anybody who uses Helium 10 or Jungle Scout or anything like that, you can pretty they can know how the brand is doing without even having to call us. Um, and the good news is because we typically end these transactions on you know, basically as friends with these sellers, having gotten to know them so deeply, 
we have a lot of sellers who text us, call us, Skype us, and say, hey, I saw this thing. And did you notice its competitor do this thing? And so it's actually really nice to have these brand advocates out there who are looking at the brand and thinking about it and sending us ideas um, and snippets. Um, and then generally, you know, uh, as, <laughs> as any of our prior sellers would probably tell you, they pretty quickly get used to not having to run their old business. Um, I don't think any of them have really gone on to play golf or, or fish full time. Most of them, they're entrepreneurs, right? And they love building things and they love starting things. And so most commonly, um, we've heard that people put half of the money away as a cushion and then take the other half and they go and they launch their next thing. But it's been a variety. We had one seller who bought an avocado farm, another seller who got into commercial real estate. Um, and so it's been actually really neat staying in touch with these sellers and seeing what they do as the next adventure. With all these different types of companies getting into Amazon businesses, how do you see these FBA investors getting their value out of all the growth efforts they put into their portfolio brands? How do you take 40, 50, 70 brands and actually turn it into cash? Is it an IPO? Do you sell it to the next level of, of private equity company? How does this work? You know, you look at, you look at a company like Thrasio, uh, the, the press says they have a billion dollar valuation. Okay, show me the actual billion dollars they're going to get out of it. How does this work? Because there's an awful lot of stickiness there. Yep, for sure. So I think at least, all I can speak about is for Perch um, and, uh, and what our plan is. As I talked about earlier uh, in this discussion, I think there's an opportunity for us to build an amazing consumer products company with brands that are household names. Um, we're starting on Amazon and we'll continue to stay disproportionately focused on Amazon because it's so big and it's growing so fast. I created this chart for my team, Amazon versus every other CPG company in the world. It's just Amazon third party. Third party Amazon is more than twice as big as any other CPG company in the world. And it's growing more than twice as fast as any other CPG company in the world. And so we're just not going to get away from it. But we will be selling our products through Walmart.com, selling our products through bricks and mortar, um, you know, Wish, Etsy, eBay, whatever. You know, we'll find the right match for the right products and sell them through those channels. But assuming that thesis comes true, that these micro brands really are high quality products that are made for e-commerce and therefore going to, and as the world goes online, we'll continue to win. I think this is an IPO company. I think we become a large consumer products company. And you look at the market cap of, you know, uh, Unilever, Procter & Gamble, Nestle. These are tens and hundreds of billions of dollars of market cap. Right. So there's a really big opportunity out there to create a next generation consumer products company um, and make this uh, you know, a real company that stands the test of time. Chris, I'm going to ask you how, did you, how did you learn how to become a fundraiser raising capital? It's a very specialized skill and not something specifically tied to, say, being a supply chain guy. Yeah. Um, just like everything else in my career, I decided I wanted to do it. And I went out and I just started calling people. I, um, I, I got really fortunate in my fundraising in that uh, Spark Capital, who's our, our backer, ended up being also the first institutional backer of Wayfair. And so Nir is the CEO and founder of Wayfair and James, the CEO of Wayfair, and introduced me. And so I did have a bit of a warm intro there. But before that meeting, I probably had 40 or 50 other uh, meetings. So this isn't like a, a, you know, I just had the right intro and I had one conversation and somebody gave me $100 million. <laughs> this was a lot of hard work. I went out, I had a pitch. I, after every meeting, when they said no, I said, well, tell me what I could have said differently. And I took notes and I updated my pitch and I went to the next one. And I actually, um, I left this out earlier, but my second job after I was developing software was I actually sold copiers. So I was a door-to-door -door copier salesperson. I would go to a business park with a pocket full of business cards and try to sell you a, a copier. Um, and it's it felt like that, right? You just you get a you get a hundred no's and you wake up the next morning and you keep going and you keep going until you get a yes. Let me ask you: with the path of managing all these companies. There are tools, there's SaaS equipment, you know, to, to tell me a little bit about your favorite software tools or consultants or companies that you're seeing in this space that you believe are going to ultimately end up helping you uh, build a better business. Yeah, there is a lot. You're right. There's a lot of software and a lot of consultants out there. We are still very much in um, kind of explore and, and tinker phase. And so we're working with a couple of different providers in several different places. 
and kind of trying to learn what works for us um, and what works best for us. We're finding that um, there's a lot of people that are very good at one specific thing and aren't always good at tying together across those things. Like, for example, you know this, right? Because you do this. Uh, I think you guys are one of the ones that have a more holistic strategy. Um, but in general, as you think about ad spend versus pricing, right? Both can be a, an important lever for driving volume within a category. And typically, anybody who does ad spend doesn't think about pricing. Anybody who does pricing doesn't think about ad spend. And so, you know, we're kind of constantly in the middle trying to figure those things out. And so we're still very much in an explore mode. But I don't mean that to say we're internally focused. I actually think one of the amazing things about this ecosystem is there's so many people who know so much. But we're trying to run around and pick up all the, all the jewels that we see out there. Um, and the other fortunate thing we have is all the sellers. So every seller that we buy from has been massively successful. And so we always really listen to them and talk to them and understand what made them successful, what made the next person successful, and how do we take these lessons and take the best of them and apply them across our entire portfolio. Chris, I want to thank you for joining us today on the Buybox Experts podcast. For those of you who are interested in learning more about Perch, please visit perchhq.com. Thanks for listening to the Buy Box Experts podcast. Be sure to click subscribe, check us out on the web, and we'll see you next time.